available to you. Because you don't have the, uh, the guy sitting across the desk from you that wants to literally swap deeds, now you want to go through a procedure that is sanctioned by this, this part of the code, where at closing, you assign your rights under the sale to a qualified intermediary. A qualified intermediary is a neutral party who will hold the money for you. A qualified intermediary cannot be anybody that is related to you legally or by business. So in other words, it can't be your own lawyer or your own CPA or your own real estate broker because those people are deemed to be extensions of you for tax purposes. It has to be a third party qualified intermediary. It could be another individual that, that with proper documentation, or more likely, it's depending upon the size of the transaction, it's going to be an escrow company or a 1031 company that's affiliated with one of the title insurance underwriters. I used to do it with another lawyer, uh, firms across the street, and like I would hold money for her and she'd hold money for me. We'd have our documentation and we'd charge the client for the documentation and such. But what happened was these big companies were doing it more efficiently and cheaper. So we stopped holding the money, we just let them hold it. At the time, yes? When you say qualified? Th that it's, it's a term of art. Okay. A qualified intermediary means someone who's not disqualified. Okay, so it's not like a license? No. Okay. It's, it's, it's a tax thing. Okay. It means someone who is not related to the taxpayer legally by business, so that would disqualify them, not a related party. So at closing, you assign your sale transaction to the qualified intermediary. The qualified intermediary holds the money. You then have 45 days from the date of the closing to designate one or more replacement properties. Without getting into too much detail, basically you can, you can designate three. You don't have to close on them. You don't have to be under contract. You have to, in writing, designate and deliver the designation to an adverse party, which would be the qualified intermediary or somebody else. You have 180 days from the closing, these are concurrent time frames, to close on the replacement property. This is not, it's not like you have 45 plus 180, they run together. That means these are hard and fast dates. You don't get extensions, you don't get please can I have a little more time, uh, and there is actually a shortening of time. Uh, if you're doing it at the end of the year, I think you have to close before your tax return is due, including all extensions. So that could be a shortening. So 180 days? 180 days after it, the which closing. Which includes the 45 yes, days. Yes, but that is, they are concurrent. They run okay. together. Okay? And as far as identifying the property in 45 days, you have to legally notify the IRS? Or do no. You have to have it's a form that you give to the qualified intermediary. It could be a letter. You'd be, but usually the, the nice thing about the commercial ones is they'll give you a form. They'll say fill this out and put the property in, it could be an address, and you can designate multiple properties. You don't have to close on them, you just have to close on one of them. Um, into the time frames. You have to replace your investment. There's a three prong test of the replacement of your investment. The purchase price of the replacement property has to be at least what you sold the relinquished property for. Property, relinquished property is the property you sold. You have to invest all the cash that you got if you had a mortgage on the old property, and you have to replace the debt, which means if you, if you, if you by the way, if it, I'm saying you have to, you have to in order to have 100% of the tax benefit of the deferral. If you do all of these things, then you will pay no gain on this transaction. What was the third? All Replace the, debt. the debt. Replace the debt. It was the second. Call the cash. Oh, okay. It's a little peculiar, but it's a three-pronged test with the exceptions that are a little too much detail. But hold on. It's, you're basically are taking everything that you had and you're replacing it. Because if you had a mortgage of $100,000, and now you only take a $40,000 mortgage on the replacement property, it's deemed that you've been given something back. You, you've taken some money off the table, which is legally called boot. Boot is what they, they when you take money, and you, you're allowed to take cash, or you're allowed to do these things, you just pay tax on it. You're not, you're not like, no, you can't do that. 
you're just going to wind up paying tax on it. So the only exception to the mortgage is if you, let's say, in my example, you had a $100,000 mortgage on the property you sold, and you only want a $40,000 mortgage on the replacement property because you just don't want to carry that much debt on it. If you take the $60,000 difference in cash from another source, not from what you sold, you have money in the bank. You can add extra money in, you can replace the debt that you've given up, and you're not deemed to take boot. If you take boot, put money in your pocket, you're going to pay as if that was, whatever your ratio of gain was, in my example, where you sold for, for 500,000 and your basis was only 5,000, that same ratio would apply to every dollar of boot. That you take uh, Okay, Whether, so, so some people take, some people say, I want to, I'm, I'm cashing out this property, I want a little bit of money. I don't want to give it all up. So, <clears throat> Place the debt, what's the, the other two? Cash, purchase, purchase price. price. Purchase okay. price, invest on cash. Okay, so what's the cost of this? Any, any time the IRS gives you a benefit, there's going to be a cost associated with it, right? Whenever you sell, you have to pay the taxes, right? No, you keep doing no. this. You just keep doing it. Here's the problem. The problem is now, in my example, you have deferred $495,000 worth of gain, okay? Now you go and you buy a replacement property, and let's say, let's say you take the $500,000 and you add either extra cash or you get a bigger mortgage, you can go up, you can add more, and you buy something for $750,000. Normally, if you go out and you buy a piece of property for $750,000, you have a basis of the property of $750,000. Why is basis important? Basis is important for two reasons. Number one, if you are, if you, when you resell the property, that is your cost for determining whether you've made a gain for paying income tax on the sale of the property. And secondly, if it's investment property and you're depreciating it, you can only depreciate to the extent of your basis. So, in what happens to that four hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars of deferred gain? is it reduces the basis on your replacement property. <laughs> so now you do this and now you have your $750,000 property and three years from now something great has happened <coughs> and you can get a million dollars for it. In a normal situation, the million dollars minus the seven fifty dollars would be a gain of two fifty, dollars But here, it's the million dollars minus the seven fifty dollars minus the four ninety five. dollars so eventually you're going to pay the fiddler, as they say. Okay? That's a deferral right. It keeps rolling. You can, you can keep going. You can keep rolling. You can keep doing this over and over. And there are people that keep doing it until you die. If, if you're an individual and you own this as an individual, when you die, even though there's an estate tax on the value of your estate, if your estate is big enough, your heirs get a step up in basis and the gain goes away. Hmm. Yeah. Wait, rotating. I think he was first. He's always on location. So can you do it for a property that, let's say you were in the process of selling this property to do it as a 1031 and you bought something else, not under your company, but under your personal name? First? Yes. Wait, what did you do first? Buy something else. Okay. Can you use, and you bought it under your name, can you use whatever you sell here that you're wanting to do the 1031 exchange to and then come bring it over here and put it under your company name? Good question. That's called a reverse exchange. Okay. But you've got to set it up the right way. You can't, if, if you do it, if you happen to buy something mm -hmm. and you haven't planned this out, then the answer is no. If you know this is something you're trying to do, and we're getting into a, we're getting a little more sophisticated than, than but I want, to, I want to go down this road because it's... I like, have a client that asked me that question and I said, contact an attorney. I don't know the answer, but I have... Oh, should I turn the clock on? Huh? <laughs> huh? Should I turn on the clock? He's giving a legal <laughs> <laughs> In a reverse exchange, what you do is, in the vernacular, when you're doing a regular exchange, you're parking the money. Right. 
In a reverse exchange, you're parking the property. I see. Okay? So here's how that works mechanically. Because uh, I was going to get into single member limited liability companies, and if you're a human or you want to put it into an entity and how you can do things like that. A single member limited liability company is a pass through entity. And don't, don't, we're not going to, let's not do this today. I just want to go off and give you a little background. It's disregarded for federal tax purposes. So you can, what happens is you form a single member limited liability company, but the qualified intermediary is the owner. Gotcha. Okay? You obviously have enough money to buy the property, the replacement property first. So you loan that money to the qualified intermediary. It's actually a promissory note. And the qualified intermediary goes out and buys the replacement property. And in this LLC, but they are the member of the LLC. Mm -hmm. Okay? You, you've loaned them the money to do that. Now, you sell your relinquished property, the property you want to sell at the game. You take them, the proceeds from that, you designate and you buy the, the, the property from the qualified intermediary right. by acquiring the LLC, which is the only time you can do it with a single member. They take the money from and they repay the loan. Now, then does that negate the rule that the party can't have any personal relationship to you? They, this, you're still using the qualified intermediary. It's still the QI. You, said, you just said this Because it's the entity? It's, it's still the qualified to, yes, they own the entity. Gotcha. The fact that you've set it up is just, you know, who's doing the paperwork. Okay. They own the entity. So they're, it's still, they, they are the buyer of the property. From the third party, you're now going to go buy the whole thing from them. Got it. Everybody confused? Yeah. No, I get it. I'm okay, good. It. Yes, I'll, I'll come back to you. Can you um, do an exchange, exchange into a real estate investment trust? No. You have to invest in like kind, okay? Mm. You sell, and I don't. And like kind doesn't mean farmland for farmland. Like kind means real estate for real estate. Exactly. You cannot invest into an entity. What? What if? Okay, let's say O, right? O owns retail commercial centers, right? And let's say I own commercial real real estate centers as well, and I can't do an exchange with a RIT. No, they, no, no. They own you said real estate. So no, but we're going to do an exchange. They own that property. I own this property, but they're like kind properties, right? Yeah. And then I just exchange with, oh, like you know, well, I the, do the, the ten thirty one with the actual rent. Does that you understand what I'm saying? Are you you swap? But you're, there's going to be a deed and a closing, right? Correct. Then, then, then the nature of the ownership is irrelevant. Okay. I thought I thought your question was. Well, can you buy a, an interest in the REIT that owns the real estate as your replacement property? And the answer to that is no. So they can't they can't give me stock instead correct. of giving me the property. Exactly correct. Okay. Now, how can, clever lawyers can get around almost anything. Hold on. <laughs> can't you do it with an common interest though? Very good. Excellent. Yes. You've obviously been around this stuff. There was just exactly where I was going. So what you can do is you can buy a piece of the of the real estate. So X Y O owns the shopping center. You can't afford to buy the shopping center. Uh -huh. You can afford to buy 25% of the shopping center. Uh -huh. You don't buy 25% of the company. You literally buy a 25% interest in the land, and you own it as tenants in common. Uh -huh. Okay, which would be partners, except you're not partners. You're not partners. You just own it together as tenants in common. And there's an agreement that says specifically, we're not partners. We just happen to own this property together, and we agree to manage it together. But we are not partners because that would be a partnership. And this is not a partnership. We're just co-owners. And it's called a tenancy in common and a tenancy in common agreement. Hmm. But they can't give you shares of it. Shares of it. Correct. Right? Cannot buy shares. You buy, you're selling no real estate. Correct. You are selling real estate. You have to buy real estate. And by the way, with the recent changes in the tax code, there used to be you could do these exchanges with personal property. They took the, for some reason they did away with it. And where that was important was where the manufacturing company had the fully depreciated forklift, and they wanted to replace it with a new forklift. So instead of 
selling the forklift for whatever it was worth on a trade-in and having to pay tax because they had no basis in it, you used to be able to do an exchange with the forklift for a new forklift and say, you know, whatever the old forklift was plus X number of cash gets you the new forklift and there would be no tax consequence. They have eliminated that from the code. I don't know why. Like kind. All right, I just want to go back and touch on the single member limited liability company. Since, a single, since the single member limited liability company is a disregarded entity, what is, it is able to be used for is let's say you own a piece of property that you're going to sell. And your lawyer has said to you, you know, it's really not a good idea for you to own investment property in your own name. You really should have an entity. Well, you could use a single member limited liability company to buy the new property because it's the same taxpayer, it's a flow through, it's disregarded. And there's some other strategic uses for it, but if you want to get it into an entity, you can do that. Now, this is only available for investment property of 1031. So available for investment property that's held for investment or used in your trade or business. You cannot do this with your personal residence because it is not used for the business. Um, you have to be careful because you, if you are buying it with the intention of flipping it, then you're not intending to hold it for investment and therefore it doesn't qualify. Well, what would disclose that intention? It's like, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. If you bought it and all of a sudden it got resold within two months, one might think that you were not intending to hold it for investment. So they tell you, old and cold. There's another place where this comes up as a problem, is the old and cold, and it's called a drop and swap. I'm getting into a little bit more sophisticated uh, thing, but I want to discuss it because what happens is you have partners in a piece of property. And maybe you have an LLC with four families that own, each own 25% of the LLC, that own the property. And you've got a good offer to sell it. One of the people says, let's do a 1031. We won't have to pay any tax. Somebody else says, no, I'm tired of this. I want to cash out. I'm getting older. I don't want to be in property anymore. I want liquidity. I don't want to do this anymore. Now you've got a problem. Or, and then the third guy says, yeah, I'm sick of being in business with you. It happens, it, honestly, it's all, it all happens. Can't make, you can't make up some of this no. stuff. So what the technique would be, if it were, if you did it, it's something you have to do over a longer period of time. Because if you do it too quickly, it's a problem. The technique that was that the IRS will pounce on you for is called drop and swap. And that is, you take the LLC and you term, you, you liquidate it by distributing to each of the owners of the LLC a 25% interest, in my example, of the property as tenants in common. Now you each own real estate. Now you go and you take, you accept your offer to sell the property, and each person can independently either take the offer, take the cash, the cash in the pocket, pay the tax, or go on and buy something else. The problem is that the IRS has taken the position with the drop and swap is if you do it in a short amount of time. You, the, ta the taxpayer, now owning the real estate after it's come out of the LLC, is holding it for the purpose of resale, not for the purpose of investment. So then is it an all or none? Or you wait a year. All or none or wait a year? Yeah. Because it's called old and cold. If you, if you... Old and cold. Old and cold. Well, it's a, it's a tax thing that's used in all kinds of tax planning if, because the IRS looks at what's called step transactions, which is what this is, where they're going to look at the two different transactions together and say, why are you doing this so close together? Maybe it was all a scheme. And if it's all a scheme, the real scheme was, we're going to sell out interest in the LLC, and that doesn't qualify for the 1031. So that's, it doesn't work. 
So it's all intent. So that's exactly what it is. Uh, other little gimmicks that go on. Uh, you buy. This, this happens again. And as long as you hold on to it for enough period of time that the intent is not contrary to what the regulations require, people will do this. Gee, that's a really nice house over there. I think I'm going to buy it for investment purposes in my 1031. In reality, the ultimate goal of the, of the client is to acquire a vacation home, <laughs> or which is personal use. But for the first year, they're not in there, and they're going to they're offering it for for rental. It's an investment property, so it qualifies. At the end of the year, they realize that the rental market really isn't great, and they're going to convert the use. If it's done that way, and it's done slow, you know, over a long period of time, so yeah, they saw the low basis with the 1031. But there's no tax consequence if they now use it to live it. It's all kinds of things. <laughs> You still said there's still a, the, a, not really uh, avoiding tax, or well, what's the word? Defer? Defer. <coughs> it's deferring tax, but you eventually pay them sometime. If you defer, you eventually have to pay them. Oh, eventually you pay it, so you're not evading. Yeah. You're not even avoiding, you're just postponing it. Right? There's, a, there's an easier word to work with. So all you're doing is you're postponing it. Now, where that becomes an issue for some people is if you look historically, Capital gains rates have been much higher. They've been lower. Mm -hmm. So you know now you know there's been a change in the last couple of years. It took it from 20 to about 23 percent. So I've had clients say to me, "Yeah, I know about this 1031, but I'm afraid the rates are going to be higher in five years or 10 years. I'm going to pay. I'm going to go ahead and pay the tax and not worry about it in the future." So all, all different kinds of planning that goes on. Let's see. What about what if you 1031 into 1031 into a triple net investment, right? Right. Then after a year, you refi, take the proceeds from the refi, just let it pay down the mortgage. Okay. So well, I'm actually glad you brought that up. You're okay because you waited a year. Okay. The old and cold. If you, if you refi, like you do the 1031, it's a good question. You do the 1031, and two months later you go to the bank and borrow money, boom. Take that. Okay? So you had to take, take that year in there. You, you, take, you, take, you went in there with the idea of taking the cash out. Yep. Yeah, okay, you waited a little bit for show, but not enough, because you had an intention at the time to take the money back off the table. Boot. You, the, the whole concept is to preserve your existing investment in real estate. And that's why, the, that's why you have to look at the cash. Do you have any history of the 1031, why it came to be? Like, what, what's the incentive for the government to defer taxes? There was a, okay. There was, the, the original concept was a deed for deed exchange. Okay. okay. You didn't get any money. And that was okay. There was a tax case called Starker, which I don't know, 70s maybe? Maybe, yeah, I would say in the 70s. And in Starker, they established the concept of a deferred exchange. And since the court said it was okay, because in reality they were continuing their investment in real estate, Congress looked at it and said, you know, People are going to do this. The courts have said it's okay. We really should codify it, pass a statute, pass some regulations, and put some parameters on it so that you know, it doesn't get played around with. And then that's what happened. I mean, the con it's, it's kind of like trading in, if you will. You know, when, and like I said, it used to be with business equipment you could do that. But you think about it, you, you stay in the real estate business. Keeping your investment in the real estate business, all you're doing is you're trading from one parcel to another. It's permissible.
it's as tempting as it is. It's, uh, I, I can assure you that coming up with four hours of material on a given topic is not the easiest thing in the world. I, I, I did not realize that when I signed on for this. I, see, I run out of steam. Even, even the real estate contract last week, you know, we got to like three and a half, three and three quarters. Like, what are we going to pay for here? Throw a pop quiz at them. I'm not doing that to you guys. It doesn't have to be for points. This is for attention. You guys are scared. Yeah, exactly. Kill. <laughs> I'm trying to kill 20 minutes. I like, I'm, like Jeopardy, like anything. You could just let us out. I can. That's a great suggestion. That is like the best I've heard this far. That's the master of all. And here's some good morning. Get up to 6 a.m. Sorry, I'm going to go back to something real fast. We're in the loan documents. What's that? Are we back in the loan documents? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come? Or, or you can say no more. <laughs> it's not documents. It's just it's a concept I want to talk about real fast. I have this outline. I probably had to, I don't know, I created an outline for some reason. I probably had to have a syllabus um, approved for this. But I do, there are two interesting things that I forgot to talk about in, in, the, in the mortgaging. One is called, and they're very similar, one is called cross-collateralization, and the other is called cross-default. This is a situation where you have an investor, a borrower, with multiple properties, and they're dealing with the bank on the multiple properties. Now, maybe the bank is saying, Listen, we're limiting you to a 70% loan-to-value ratio on this property, this investment property. And the borrower says, I really need a little more cash now. I have this other property that I'll give you a second mortgage on, or a first mortgage on, on the other property which has more value to it. Now you have, the bank has a mortgage on two different properties to secure one loan. They're cross-collateralized. It could theoretically be you have multiple loans, and I can, I'm not bringing that document. You don't want to see that. Trust me, you don't want to see that document. It's a, it's a client that owns a chain of car dealerships, and they really deal with one primary lender. And every time they do anything, they have the lender keeps the collateral on all of them, and they're in multiple counties, and it's a royal pain. But that so so it's cross collateralization means that. More than one property serves as collateral for the one loan. Cross default is more serious. Cross default is a situation where, again, you have multiple loans with the same lender, and the lender says, if you don't pay me over here, and you go into default on the loan on this building, I'm going to hold you in default on the other three buildings that I have mortgages on. And that doesn't sound like a common occurrence, but as a preview for something, I, I mentioned briefly, and it's a, it's a practice area I've gotten into, not by accident, but it's actually kind of interesting, and that's these cannabis lease issues. I had a client call, look, I don't know, it picks up when I use the word cannabis. Uh, it's about 4.20 <laughs> and you start talking about cannabis. Not <laughs> <laughs> really, but that's good. It's coincidence. It's coincidence. I, I actually had a client, we were working on a lease, and he said to me, it was just in the spring we were doing this, and he said that he wanted the commencement date of the lease to be 420. And he was serious. <laughs> he was serious. No, here's, so here's what happened. So, <laughs> and, and I do these in other, not so close to Florida, it so it's legal. But I'm not admitted to these other states. But so what happened, what, what happened in this particular case, it's it's going back to the cross and fault. Mortgage loan, mortgages provide if you're operating something like a shopping center. That if you go to enter into a new lease, a major lease, or even a minor lease in a lot of situations, you have to have the lease approved by the lender. Especially if it's over a certain number of square feet for the most part. Now, it shouldn't be every, it depends on how it's negotiated. So the client had a potential tenant here in Florida for a legal medical marijuana dispensary. And so they went to their bank and they said, we want to put this tenant in there. They can pay rent, etc. Normal lease. But as we all know, it's still illegal federally. Mm -hmm. 
the bank said, if you put this tenant in the shopping center, not only will we default you on the loan for this shopping center for violating federal law and for violating our mortgage covenants, but you have three other loans on three other shopping centers and we're going to cross default you under your whatever it is clause. So there is an absolutely perfect practical example of where it can come into play. So it's an unusual covenant, but it happens. All right, I'm going to grant your wish. Thank you. And I hope it's not too